So today we're going to be looking at optimization problems. Now, optimization problems in and of themselves are basically just finding the critical points on a graph and saying, hey, where's the highest point, where's the lowest point? Um, but scenarios where you might run into these are things where you might run into where is the maximum profit, where is the minimum loss, where is the path of least action, things like that. Um, basically, peaks of curves and troughs of curves are what we're trying to find out. So without further ado, let's jump into one of them and just kind of see how it goes. So to jump into the first one, we're going to be finding the length and width of a rectangle that has a perimeter of 80 meters with the maximum possible area. So we've also been told to sketch a graph of the scenario. So first off, I'm going to include a couple sketches in my sketch area. The first one being that I want to find the length and width of a rectangle. So let's set that up. And I'm just going to arbitrarily call this length and that width. We have a perimeter of 80 meters, so what I know is that my perimeter is set up of both of these, so 2L plus both of those, so 2W. And I know that this is 80 is 2L plus 2W. I can divide all those by 2. So 40 is L plus W. So I've got this expression right there. And I'm trying to find the maximum area. Well, the second equation is area is length times width. So most likely what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and see if I can't eliminate one of the variables and plug it into the area equation. So let's just arbitrarily solve for L. So 40 minus W is equal to length. And I'm going to stick this into my L. So now area is a function of width. So let's see, 40 minus W times W. Let's see, that's... 40w minus w squared. Awesome. So what I've got now is I have a formula for area that I'm going to try and maximize. Now, you might think to yourself, hey, this is a quadratic. Quadratic with a negative leading coefficient. It's going to look something like that. I'm probably going to find that peak point right there. And you'd be exactly right. But let's assume that we don't actually know the shape of this. Let's assume that when we plug these values in, it gave us a formula that we're not really sure what's going on. Well, how would I know I'm finding the vertex of a quadratic? Well, the first step that we would do is we would say, okay, let's try and sketch a scenario of this. And the easiest way to sketch a scenario is to first see if we can't find any zeros. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to say zeros. I'm going to take this original graph, so 40w minus w squared, and set it equal to zero. Well, luckily what I can do is I can factor out a w, so w. 40 minus w, which means w is going to equal 0, and w is going to equal, let's see, if 40 minus w is equal to 0, let's add a w, and so w is also equal to 40. So I have two zeros going on. After I find my zeros, I would go ahead and I would find the first derivative. So a prime, I would go ahead and I'd say, okay, that's going to give me a 40 minus 2w. Now, this first derivative is going to tell me where the maximum and minimum points occur. Not really going to tell me which ones they are, but it's going to tell me where they happen. So if I set this equal to 0, let's see, I would subtract the 4, so negative 2w equals negative 4. So w, hold on, that's not a 4, that's a 40. So w is going to equal 20. So I know I have a maximum or minimum point that occurs at 20. And now the next thing that I could do, this is honestly going to tell me what I need to know, but just in case I wanted to see the full shape of the graph, I would go ahead and I would find a double prime, which can tell me the concavity. Is it the maximum or is it actually the minimum point? So if I take the derivative of this, I just get negative 2, which means this is constantly concave down because of the negative value. And so let's take a look at what that graph would look like given this information. So I have a graph that looks something like this. I know this is area and this is width. I know that I have a zero here and here because we arbitrarily said that this is 10, 20, 30, and 40. I have a zero at both those points. 
I also know that due to my first derivative test, I have some sort of maximum or minimum point. Now, at 20, what I'm going to do is I would actually plug in some values to see is the graph going up or down towards that maximum minimum point. So why don't I do that? If I plugged in a 0 into this graph, that 0 out, so I get 40. So the graph is going up. On the other side, if I plugged in 40, let's see, 40 minus 2 times 40, that would be minus 80. I would get a negative, which means the graph is going down. In fact, the full graph is going to be concave down the entire time. So the only way this happens is if the graph, let's actually do this in red. So, so at this point, the graph flattens out. I go up, down, concave down the entire time. And at this point is my maximum point, which occurs exactly at, let's see, so I have a width of 20 meters. And to find the length, I just take that 20 meters and I plug it into one of my original equations. So 40 minus 20 is 20. So that point occurs at a width of 20 and a length of 20, which if we wanted to figure out what that area implies is the maximum possible area is 400 meters squared. Awesome. So we see optimization really isn't too bad. It is just using what we've already seen concerning first derivative and second derivative and finding those critical values. So let's pop off to the next one. So I'm finding the point on the graph of a function f of x equals x squared that is closest to the point 2 comma 1 half. Okay. So let's go ahead and take a look at what's going on here. So I have what looks like a graph that looks like this. And I have some sort of function that looks like that. That's a quadratic opening up, the parent quadratic. So y equals x squared. And I have some point 2, 1 half. Well, if I plug in 2 into this, I'd get 4. So I'm going to be somewhere right here. And I want to find what point on that graph makes this the smallest possible. And so now this little clip out, let's go ahead and take a nice little look at what's going on right here below. So what I have is I have whoop, my graph. I'm doing my best to sketch that. So let's zoom in a little bit so we can get a better image. So I have my graph right there. I have my point, and I want to find that. Well, I know I can find this distance, which is minimized, by creating a little triangle right there. And say, OK, to find that distance, I need to find the difference between my x value, which in this case is 2, 1 half, and some point on the function, which is some x comma y. Let's see. Well, the distance of this triangle is going to be my x, which is 2, minus my x on here, which is x. My height is going to be the opposite. I'm going to get y minus 1 half. And I can set up a little relationship using Pythagorean theorem to figure out what that is. So let's come over here and set that up. So we know distance is equal to, actually, let's set it up full Pythagorean. So hypotenuse squared is equal to leg squared, so 2 minus x squared, plus other leg squared, so y minus 1 half squared. Now, this looks good. The only problem is, to minimize this distance, first I need to solve for d. So d is equal to the square root of all this, so 2 minus x squared plus y minus 1 half squared. The second thing is I need to make this all in terms of either x or y. So I need to figure out a way to replace either x or y with the other one. And do I have a way to do that? Yes, I do. I can replace the y with an x squared. 
So I'm going to say distance is equal to 2 minus x squared plus, instead of saying y, x squared minus 1 half squared. Boom. Now I have a function. And now this function is going to give me distance. And if I plug in different values, what it's going to look like, let's see, the distance as I move farther over here is going to increase. So I'm expecting a graph. I don't really have anywhere to draw this right now. But I'm expecting a distance of really big, and it's going to come down. And then somewhere in this range, it looks like it might come back up. No. Yeah, we're just going to say, okay, it comes back up eventually. So it's going to come down, and then it's going to come back up. And then at this point, it's going to be its minimum value. So I'm probably looking at that thing right there. So, okay. So let's take a look at how we would do that. So my first step is to find the derivative of this, which as of right now, this looks really garbled and confused. So I'm going to see if I can't clean up what's inside there. So if I square this, I'm going to have, let's just go ahead and foil this. So that's going to be 4. 2 times negative x is negative 2x. And negative 2x is going to be negative 4x. And then negative x times negative x is positive x squared. And then over here, x squared times x squared is x to the fourth. Negative 1 half times x squared is negative half x. Negative half x, which is actually just negative x squared. And then negative half times negative half is positive 1 fourth. Cool. And then if I go and combine these, let's use green to combine terms. I see those cancel out. So d is equal to x to the fourth minus 4x. So I'm going to convert that into one fraction. So 4 as fourths is going to be 16 plus 1, 17 fourths. Boom. Okay, so that is much nicer. So I can deal with that one. So I want to find this is going to give me the distance as I move around this, as this distance changes shape. So what I want to do is I know there's going to be some sort of value right there that's going to be important. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to find the first derivative of this, which is going to tell me where that minimum or maximum value hits. So d prime. Let's see. So this is a chain rule. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that and say, okay, that is 1 half of this. So x to the fourth minus 4x. Four plus 17 fourths, and I'm going to subtract 1 from the power, so negative 1 half. Then I'm going to say, okay, chain rule states that take the derivative of this whole thing and multiply it times the derivative of the inside. So that's going to be a 4x cubed minus 4. Okay. Then if I rewrite this, d prime is equal to, well, that's going down to the bottom. So the thing that's left at the top is 4x cubed minus 4 all over 2 root x to the fourth minus 4x plus 17 fourths. Awesome. So I know if I set that equal to 0, I can ignore the entire bottom. I get 4x squared minus 4. 4x squared equals 4, x squared equals 1, x equals positive and negative 1. So I have two maximum and minimum points. So I'm going to take a look at this and say, okay, I have a maximum at positive 1 and at negative 1. Cool. So I've got two different values here and here. So, let us sketch this. Now, I'm out of room to sketch this. That was just the given scenario. Um, I'm going to take up the sketch room right here. So, this isn't for number four. This is still for number three. 
what I've got going on is I have some sort of graph that I'm sketching that I know at negative, positive and at negative one, I have part A, part B, part C. So what I'm gonna have to do is I'm gonna have to plug in some values to see what is this graph doing around these points. So at negative one and at positive one, I wanna check it out. So let's go ahead and set up our derivative. So what I've got right here is this is my derivative. So four x cubed minus four, close numerator, divided by two, oh, let's open up parentheses, two root x to the power of four minus four x plus 17 fourths. So close denominator and let's go ahead and take our table and let's plug in some values. So I'm gonna plug in a value to the left of negative one, let's try negative two, and I get a negative, which means this graph is going down. Let's plug in a value between. The graph is going down, and let's plug a value on the end, four. The graph is going up. So what it looks like is going, if I have a down, down, up, the only way this graph is going down and hits a minimum point is if I flatten out. So let's just draw a sketch of what we see. So I know this is a flat point. I know the graph must be coming down. And then at that flat point, it goes down some more. And here, it's got another flat point. And then the graph is going up. So it's going to look something like that. So what I want to find is I want to find the minimum distance. So it looks like I'm going to be trying to find this, which is going to happen at x equals 1. I could check concavity on that, but again, the only way this goes from down to up is by hitting some sort of minimum. So that's really all I need to do to figure out where this is. So if it happens at x equals 1, let's plug 1 into our function. 1 squared is 1. So it happens at a value of 1, 1, is the point on our graph that is the smallest or the least distance away from this point of 2, 1 half. And so that brings us to so the next set of problems. So here I'm dealing with a couple different scenarios. So let's take a look at the first one. So the first one, I have a manufacturer that wants to design an open box having a square base and a surface area of 108 square inches. What dimensions will produce a box with maximum volume? So let's take a look at this. I know it has a square base and it doesn't have a top, so let's draw a square box. It doesn't look like there's any restriction on height, so this could be something that's like, you know, a rectangular prism. The only thing that we know is the fact that this rectangular prism has an open top so I can see inside it. If that isn't a beautiful piece of artwork, I don't know what is. Um, and so we have a square base. I have x times x, and I have some unknown height on the box. I could put it on its side and say, hey, this is, you know, length, width, and height, but we're just gonna go with this. So I know the surface area of this box is 108 square inches. So let's go with the surface area. So the area of my box is going to be, let's see, four of these, and then one of these. And that's going to equal 108. So there's equation number one. We want to find the maximum volume, though. So the equation for volume is going to be length by width by height, so x squared h. So I'm going to need to take my secondary equation and take something from my first and plug it in. So let's go ahead and solve for a variable. There's only one h, so I'm going to solve for h. Two x's, so this is going to be, in my opinion, the easier root. So if I subtract that, that is going to be 108 minus x squared, and then I'm going to divide that by the 4x. I'm going to take that and stick that into the equation. 
So my volume as a function of nothing but x is going to be x squared times 108 minus x squared all over 4x. Which then looks like some of those x's can cancel out, so volume is equal to x times 108 minus x squared all over 4. And if I distribute that x in, I get, let's see, 108 can divide by 4. That'll give me 27. So 27x minus 1 fourth x cubed. So what we see is going on here is that I have a cubic function with a negative coefficient, so it's going to do something like that. But I have a couple restrictions. I know the height, or the, the variables, what's going on is that x has to be greater than 0, and h has to be greater than 0. Otherwise, if any one of these variables was 0, the box wouldn't exist. It would be purely theoretical, purely mathematical. So there's some restrictions. I'm assuming with the x is greater than 0, part of this graph is going to be excluded. So I'm only looking at probably this dip right here. So our first step is to find, OK, this looks pretty easy to find where the zeros could be. So let's go ahead and find the zeros of the function. So when does 27x minus 1 fourth x cubed equal 0? Well, I can factor out an x, which means that one of my zeros is at 0. And I'm left with 27 minus 1 fourth x squared. So let's see, so I add that. Multiply by 4. And then I square root it. So the square root of 108, positive and negative, is equal to x. And if I go ahead and try and figure out what is the square root of 108, second square root of 108, I get 10.39. So positive and negative 10.39 is equal to x. Awesome. So the next thing that we're going to do is, now that we found our three zeros, I notice that the negative I'm not really going to worry about. I want to find where do those maximum and minimum points occur, which means I need to find v prime. So I'm going to take the derivative of this, which is 27 minus 3 fourths x squared, and set that equal to 0. So let's see, I add that over there. So 27 equals 3 fourths x squared. Multiply by 4 and divide by 3. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to divide by the 3 to give me a 9, then times 4, which is 36. So I get positive negative 6 is equal to x. But I know that I'm only dealing with x is greater than 0. So I'm going to go ahead and just say the 6 is equal to my x. And if I plug in the 6 into this equation, so that's going to be 108 minus, let's see. Yeah, so if I'm plugging in 6 into this equation, oops, yeah, into that equation for height, I get 106 minus 36 is 72. Divide that by 4 times 6, which is 24. I get 3. So it happens at a height or at an x of 3, no, x of 6 inches and a height of 3 inches. There we go. And so just to give you a sketch of what that graph would look like, let's take a look. So what's going on is I have three zeros at 0, at negative 10.3, and positive 10.3. So that's 0, negative 10.3, and positive 10.3. Um, I know at x equals positive and negative 6, I have my values. And what I could do is I could go ahead and I could plug in this equation. So let's set that up to 27 minus 3 fourths is 0.75x squared. And let's set up a table and say, OK, let's plug in a number to the left. So negative 7, 
a number in the middle, and a number to the right. So I get the graph is going down, up, and down because I get a negative, a positive, and a negative. So what I know the graph is doing, going down to up, this is going to be a minimum. Up to down, this is going to be a maximum. Should have drawn that a little higher, but oh well. So minimum, maximum, boop. Okay. And so what we know is the fact that we're dealing with some values that we're going to be excluding. X has to be greater than zero. So I already know that, let's use green, I'm not dealing with any of these. And I also know the fact that after this point, my volume goes back to being negative. So I'm assuming I've taken so much of my x, I'm having to borrow from height. So I'm only looking between these two values right here. And that occurs at this point where my x was 6 and my height was 3 inches. I can figure out what the maximum volume would be, but it's not asking for that, so we're going to go ahead and move on. But that's how we get that one. So let's take a look at number seven. Now, what I'd like you to do at this point, you've seen a couple optimization problems. Go ahead and try this one out. Go ahead, pause the video, try out number seven, unpause it when you're done, and see how well you did. Okay. So let's try this one. Now, this one is a little tricky because we're not dealing with one shape. It looks like we're dealing with two shapes. I have four feet of wire used to form a square and a circle. So I know a square is going to be squared like that, and a circle is going to be dealing with probably the radius. I know I have four feet of wire to use to form these. So I'm going to be dealing with perimeter, and the perimeter of the square is four of those, and the perimeter of the circle is two pi radius. I know that is going to be at max four. So I'm going to divide that by two, so two equals two x plus pi r. There's one equation. Um, I want to see how much of the wire should be used for the square and for the circle to enclose the maximum total area. So I'm looking at area. So now that I've known the perimeter, I'm going to go ahead and set up the area function. So the area of the square is x squared. The area of the circle is pi r squared, which means I'm going to need to plug in one of the two of these. So I'm going to look at these and say, arbitrarily, let's solve for x. No reason other than just because. So if I solve for x, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to subtract that and then divide by 2. So I get 2 minus pi r all divided by 2 and I'm going to plug that in. So my area is equal to, let's see, 2 minus pi r all over 2 squared. So I can try and clean this up just a little bit because um, I know I'm going to see another r squared. So I could combine those, but it's also going to combine the pi. So it's going to be kind of a dirty quadratic going on. So let's go ahead and let's attempt. And if it gets too complicated, we'll just kind of dip out. So that's going to be a 4. 2 times negative pi is negative 2 pi. Two of those is going to be negative 4 pi. And then if I double that, that's going to be, or square that, that's going to be pi squared, r squared. All of these divided by 4, because 2 squared is going to be 4, plus pi r squared. So what I see is I see my r squareds right here. I see my r and I see that. So area is equal to pi squared over 4 plus pi minus 4 over 4 is going to be just pi plus 1. So there's my area function. Kind of cleaned up the best we can. So what I notice is because this is a quadratic, I notice that my graph is going to be doing something like this, which begs the question, if we're looking for a maximum possible area, it's going to be at infinity. So there's going to have to be some sort of limit plugged into place that's going to restrict me from just saying, 
Well, infinite radius gives us infinite area. Well, yeah, that's because this is going to have some sort of maximum length. Now, the x isn't too bad. So first off, we know that our first limit is that x and r both must be greater than 0. If we want to have both shapes, they've got to be greater than 0. Now, the x, if I only have 4 feet and I have 4 sides, the x has to be less than 1. The r, well, let's go ahead and figure out what that out is. If I have 4 feet on the outside, that's going to be the circumference. That's 2 pi r. So r must be less than that. So let's see, divide that. That'll give me 2 over pi. R must be less than 2 over pi. So here's my restrictions. So what I'm looking at is in this quadratic, R must be somewhere between 0 and 2 over pi, which is going to give me some area of this that I'm going to be looking at. Probably should have blanked out the other two areas, but we get the idea. So moving forward, now that we found the restrictions, let's go ahead and find the first derivative, which is going to tell us where that minimum point occurs. Because that's going to kind of help us sketch out the whole thing. So let's see. Area prime is going to be 2 times this. So pi squared over 4 plus pi r minus pi. Okay. I'm going to set that equal to 0 to find that minimum point, which means I'm going to add pi. I'm going to divide by 2. And then I'm going to try and combine this. So in order to combine these two fractions, I'm going to multiply this by 4 over 4. So I get pi squared plus 4 pi, but they're all over 4. So that way I can keep change flip. So if I flip, that will give me 4 pi over 2 times this. So 2 pi squared plus 8 pi. I can cancel out a pi, which will be 4 over 2 pi plus 8. And then divide by 2. Oh, that's going to be a 2 now plus pi plus 4. Okay, so my minimum point occurs here. And so let's just to figure out where these numbers are. My minimum point is it within my range right here. Okay. So let's see. So my minimum point, what is 2 divided by pi? So that's roughly 0.63. So Let's do this in purple. So 0.63. If I do 2 divided by pi plus 4, 2 divided by pi plus 4 is 0.28, which is roughly 0.28. That is within our tolerance, so that is going to be within what we're seeing. So let's go ahead and draw a sketch. Leaving that up a little higher this time. Okay, so what we've got going on is we know that I could find out these two zeros where they are, but they're really not important. I know roughly at 0.28, so let's call this... Well, really, I'm looking at R values between 0 and 0.63. Let's call this 0.63, which means at 0.28, a third of the way, I have... I'm assuming my minimum point. I could go ahead and plug in values into here and into here, but I already know the shape of this quadratic just from looking at it, positive coefficient quadratic, that it's going to give me a negative, which is going to produce a down, and a positive, which is going to produce an up, which is going to say I have minimum value right here. Don't know exactly where this zero is going to occur. But again, we have part of the graph that I'm not even looking at. So let's shade this out in purple. So I'm not looking at R values that don't exist or that are negative. So let's go ahead and shade these out. 
and I'm not looking at our values over 0.63. So what it looks like is going on is I'm trying to figure out which, because this is the minimum point, so this is the smallest possible area. Don't want that. I'm going to go after either this point or this point. I want to see which one's bigger. Now, I know this one's farther away, so I know that this is going to be the point that I'm going to be trying to plug in. I could just intuitively know that, or if I really wanted to prove that, I could say, okay, let's check both endpoints. So if I check both endpoints, let's go ahead and take our original equation, which is right here. Could plug this in, so let's, let's try this. That looks like it's a nice easy one. So coefficient slash, let's see, I have a pi squared divided by four. Yeah, plus pi and a coefficient. I'm saying x squared because it's the variable. It's going to treat that the same as it would for an r. So minus pi r, which in this case is an x, plus 1. Let's go to our table. So I'm going to plug in a 0 value. And so I get a maximum possible area of 1. And if I plug in this point over here, which is 2 divided by pi, I get a maximum possible area of 1.27. So again, we just proved that yes, the area over here is greater than the area on the left. So, okay. So what does that mean? Well, that means my radius, I am going to attempt to, I can't do this because if I have to have both shapes, I can't exactly go all the way in, but I'm going to put as much into the circle as possible. So my radius is going to be smack dab at 2 over pi, or as close as I can get. And I might throw like a single micron. That way it's not 0, and that somehow will encompass my little square, where my x is going to be 0. And that's going to be what's going to enclose the maximum possible area. And in essence, what this is saying is the fact that if you need both shapes, the circle is going to have more area just overall above the square. So we're going to put as much as we can into the circle to avoid the square. And there we go.